Hi, welcome to the Diablo Podcast. We are online at DiabloPodcast.com, and this is a service of DiabloInkGamers.com. I am the host, Flux. I am joined this week by Filter. Hello, everyone. This is about, what, your third or fourth show, Filter? Uh, one of the new Third one. Editions? Yeah. And Nineball, who has not been on for quite a while, but I believe has been on the most podcasts of anybody, other than me, that is. Other than you. Hello. And Nineball, you were a big fan. You were on the show a ton of times pregame and very interested. You're a big uh, Blizzard fan. You like World of Warcraft and StarCraft. Mm -hmm. And the game came out, and you played a ton of Monk, and it seemed like you got a little disenchanted after a month or so. Have you been lured back in by the patches, or were you lurking all along? Uh, I, I, have, I never really quit playing entirely. I, got, uh, I, played the, I played the Monk a lot in the beginning, and then I got, started getting uh, Trounced Inferno, and so... Instead of just like giving up, then I leveled up a wizard uh, to farm Act three, so that way I could gear my monk. And then uh, you know, uh, patch what was it, one point oh three came out, and they nerfed Inferno, and I was able to play my monk again. Uh, but then it still kind of get gotten to the problem as having issues uh, with the end of Act three, the beginning of Act four, and everything in the auction house that was an upgrade for my monk was just way outside of my price range. It started going from I could get upgrades for a few million to then it's costing tens hundreds of millions for the the next upgrade and so i got a little bit disenfranchised of that and got a little bit bored of uh farming act three and act one without getting any upgrades so my uh, playtime dropped off quite a bit uh until the <laughs> most recent patch. you were initially playing with a bunch of your friends from a wow guild are any of them still playing d3 or have they all gone back to world of warcraft um a lot of them went back to World of Warcraft, but there are a few of us that are still that are still playing Diablo. I have a, a couple friends that have still been playing Diablo, like uh, really, really hardcore, and haven't haven't been playing WoW much at all. I was watching some uh, college football yesterday, and a couple of times I saw a commercial come on. I, I see Blizzard Entertainment. I'm like, oh my god, Blizzard, cool. Maybe it's a Diablo three ad. <laughs> and no, it was for the uh, what, it was for the Panda Pack. Of course. Oh, it's been too long for Diablo three ads to be on TV anymore. If we had all had to play 15 bucks a month to play Diablo 3, would we enjoy it more? In some sick way, oh. I think yes. Yeah. <laughs> like you talk yourself into it's worth the money, so I have to play it more, therefore you'd enjoy yeah, it. In more. order Maybe to not. get down to that dollar an hour enjoyment mark, I have to play 15 hours a month. Yeah, I have had friends that played World of Warcraft in the past that had that mentality. That's, you know, it's like, I have to put at least 100 hours into this game like a month in order to feel as if I'm getting my money's worth out of it. And they eventually, you know, burned out. But I feel that there, there would be a demographic there that if Diablo had a monthly fee, they, they would just be dropping, you know, whether they had fun or not, they would just be dropping a shit ton of hours into it just because. And that red glow you see at the horizon is Bobby Kodak's eyes activating. So <laughs> my contractually obligated Bobby Kodak joke has now been served up. It's just Speaking of World of Warcraft, I saw I'm looking at those ads, I still I look at it and it's like there's like cartoon pandas doing martial arts. I'm like, if 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 tomorrow Blizzard came out and said, you know what, this has all been a huge practical joke. We're not actually doing a, 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 a you know a kung fu panda expansion pack. It's gonna be more like more you know more frozen undead dragons and chainmail bikinis. Would you be like, oh, I knew it. It was a joke all along. Would would that could that possibly still be happening? Uh no, not not really. No. I mean, it's, yeah, it's you know, it's like the uh I think we we discussed this on a podcast forever ago, but you know, it's like the the pandas were part of Warcraft lore before, you know, Kung Fu Panda, you know, ever even hit a drawing board. So, you know, it, it's been a part of the story there for since like, you know, 2000 2001 is has been out for a very long time. The thing that I still am face palming and just keep hoping is like a bad nightmare is the fact that they're putting, you know, Pokemon into uh, World of Warcraft. So that, that's still, for me, is just like one of those, like, I can't believe they, they, that they're doing this. I'm really surprised that Nintendo's not jumping on them about that, like Apple and Samsung. Yeah, that that is like one of those ones that's just kind of like, I because I, I mean, they are literally like just ripping it off completely. Oh, yeah, it's copy-paste, it, totally. Yeah. 100%. It's like there's not a single bit of originality to it. It is just the entire Pokemon formula, like, completely. Uh, back to the Diablo 3 here, a little filter. What have, what have you been doing lately? Are you still playing? Are you still having fun? Um, I'm playing off and on. 
I've been playing some Smite, playing some Minecraft just to break it up because I've kind of gotten into the mode of, well, I'm never going to really find any good rares for myself, and I'm kind of tired of grinding money to buy upgrades in the auction house. And the Witch Doctor still isn't where I would like him to be, and I have work. So I've been playing off and on. So what's your highest Paragon level to this point? Uh, let's see. I've gotten my Witch Doctor to 6, I think. And I've gotten my Barbarian up to 5. I've been leveling them. Like, basically spending my time between the two of them. I think you said you had a 13 Paragon 9-ball? Uh, yeah, I've gotten, my, I've gotten my Monk up to level 13 now. What's your second highest Paragon? Uh, I do not have a second highest Paragon. Exactly. I'm a, you're like the only person in the entire world, Phil, who has two of almost the same level. I, well, Unless they're both level zero, I, that is. Yeah. I have to attribute that to, I love the Witch Doctor, and I love the concept of the Witch Doctor, and ever since it was announced, I was like, oh, I'm going to make a Witch Doctor. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'll go play my Witch Doctor for about an hour, and then go, God, this just, it's not as good as the Barbarian. And then I go play my Barbarian with an okay face for a, another hour, and then I'm like, all right, I'm done. Yeah, I think my Demon Hunter is 10, but I really haven't played any this week. I've been playing a little of Torchlight 2. We got advanced copies of that from the guys. So I'm supposed to be playing that and writing up a whole report for Monday, which is probably not going to happen, but pretty soon. But I just haven't had much time to get into it. And and my as as has been the case for a long time, I have a I have a level 1 Paragon Barbarian and a level 1 Paragon Wizard who are completely ignored because it's no point in playing them because one character's already got 30% bonus magic find. Yeah, pretty and much. It's going to be 33% bonus magic find. Just as an aside... <laughs> Torchlight Two gonna be worth buying? Oh yes, of course. For Brent's cop. Well, it's twenty for twenty bucks, you know. Yeah, yeah. How how can you go wrong? It's had a lot of changes since. There's actually no NDA. We can talk about whatever we want. We're actually been Rush has been doing some live streaming. Actually, we just can't show anything beyond Act Two. Excellent is what they requested. So there's no NDA at all. I can talk about whatever. But I mean, obviously, this isn't a Torchlight podcast, although that might be next week. But uh, just a lot of changes since the beta. I mean, I, I played it at you know I played it at their studios in November, and the beta was kind of the same as that. Just, I mean, like the first, I mean, I've played literally like the first 20 minutes all I had time to after I installed it on Friday night. And just lots more monsters, lots of little wrinkles. There's a little more detail on some of the quests, a little more like tutorials and stuff. But I mean, they obviously have been working on it since, uh, you know, March or February. Good to see it's coming along. Yeah, no, they're, they're putting all that extra, extra time, you know, to actually put some really good polish on it. Yeah, because if it came out and it wasn't as polished as D3 is going to be, I don't think it would do nearly as good. Well, they're not trying to do the, you know, like, noob-friendly, you know, my first no, RPG no, no, type no. thing. But so, obviously, I mean, in some levels, there's less polish of that sort. But, I mean, it doesn't look like a, you know, a rushed game. And it looks like it's really, I mean, it's certainly much better than Torchlight 1 was, which actually was a very rushed game. Well, polish in the respect that the animations are very nice and smooth and the hits feel good and stuff like that, as far as polish. The mechanics. Yeah, that good. was good. That was, that was good when I played it previously. So they've, they've been, I mean, they have that stuff awesome. down pretty well. But, I mean, you know, the whole... I mean, obviously, everybody liked Diablo 3. Okay, not everybody, but many people liked it immediately. And then all the problems came in with the end-game item balance and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. So yeah. Yeah. there's really no way to comment on Torchlight about that kind of stuff for weeks yet. So, anyway, speaking of Paragon, we, we saw someone hit level 100 already. It took them about two weeks after the system started. Were you guys surprised that somebody got there that soon? That they didn't scale it to be more, you know, exponential, endless grinding? I can't say that I was terribly surprised that someone would get it that quickly. Um, I think I was uh, more surprised at just how many other people have gotten it so far. It's I, I would expect that after the first person get it, we'd be seeing it in droves. Uh, but uh, the last thing that I saw is like there's still only like 11 people at level 100 at the moment worldwide. I was I was expecting a lot more people to have hit it since then. Yeah, I was I was initially like, holy cow, somebody actually hit level 100. And then I remembered, well, I mean, it only takes a couple of days to do it in D2 if you have the right equipment. So it was really surprising, and then it really wasn't. I thought it would take longer. I mean, I remember, like, the, the Gerbarb and the Rust Barb thing in D2C, which, you know, it was, like, literally months of, like, 12 hours a day with a huge team, you know, sharing experience, clearing out the entire game. The only experience you could kill, still get was from Diablo, you know, trying to find, like, experience shrines and stuff. And it was just, you know, this huge team effort of playing characters forever. And obviously, I don't think it was going to be that slow with D3. It's much more casual-friendly. But even D2, I mean, it, it's varied a lot. You know, people got to... I think it was 109, you could get... After a letter, we said people got to 99, you know, in 32 hours or something, 37 hours. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. But in other versions, it's been really slow. I mean, you can get to like 90 without too much trouble, but then it's like, you know, it's it's longer from like 93 to 94 than it was from 1 to 93. Yeah. Yeah. And then it, it kind of keeps going up like that way. You're like, like from one, you know, from 98 to 99 is like longer than from one to 97 kind of. Yeah, thing. there's. And that that was not the case with Paragon. I mean, it gets higher, but it's not, in no way, shape, or form that kind of a growth. Yeah, because all well, all that happens with the Paragon is just your experience cap increases. What also happened in D2 is the amount of experience that you got per mob that you killed decreased. You know, the further it is that you you uh, you leveled on. So not only does it take more, you get less per kill. And the Paragon levels, it, you just you know, it just takes more, but you get the same amount of experience per kill as you go along. Yes, I think that's the major difference between the D two total grind and the D three Paragon. And also, yeah, you could you could still get plenty of Paragon experience in Act one. Yeah. you don't have to just do Act four. Or something. Oh yeah, that's also, really all that I've been playing is Act one. So the other thing between like D two and the the Paragon levels now and D two. Uh, you know, while you're being that first person to try and get to 99, you're also trying to figure out what's the most efficient way of farming. You know, how how is it that I'm going to go about this? Whereas in D3, you know, everyone already has uh, months of time to find these really efficient routes, you know, that they've done through with farming and such. So you already kind of have an idea of where you're going to, you know, go and do these runs in which to actually get, you know, really good experience in addition to, you know, just really good drops and such. Kind of have- we were talking about the Paragon stuff last podcast a couple of weeks ago, before anybody was anywhere near 100, and we were all kind of complaining that it was a little slow. We were wondering why they hadn't put experience gear, you know, experience percent experience gain stuff instead of just the ruby and a hat. Or the, and thinking uh, maybe they need to add a few more options for this, but you know, since someone got 102 weeks, maybe it's just like, oh, you just got to grind. Well, it's yeah. slow for the casual plus player like us, where we don't play all the time, but we play a good amount. And uh, well, some of us do. Yeah, there's also the uh, the Leoric signet, ring, Leoric signet rings, which have been selling for hundreds of millions of gold. Um, that are like plus twenty to thirty percent experience, and it's like a level fourteen ring. It's funny that people really value it that much, given that you don't really get that much from Paragon. Aww. I guess it's just you want it because you can have it, kind of thing. Yeah, it's yeah, it's another goal to strive towards, and some people just want to get that goal as fast as possible. I mean, you spend a hundred million on a ring that makes you one percent better at experience gain, which means nothing except that it gives you a little more magic find. So couldn't you just put that 100, 100 million gold on more magic find in the first place? <laughs> I guess that wouldn't be the same. Yeah, I guess uh, in certain respects, because, you know, it's like that is the one thing. Once you reach level 100, you don't need magic find gear any longer. You know, you can you can build yourself purely, you know, just your DPS and survivability stats. So if you play enough to get 100, you know, by now or in the high 90s or whatever, money probably isn't really that big of an issue for you anyways. So another question on Paragon levels. Does, does it feel like a last-minute addition in some ways? I have a, few, a couple of bullet points. They didn't turn the experience bonuses back on from quests for Paragon levels. They didn't turn the experience shrines back on in Inferno, which you now need. There's no new in-game gear with experience gains. And there's no Paragon-level achievements, which really seems weird to me, given how many of like the, you know, the graduated from kindergarten type, type achievements there are in the game. Mm-hmm. Hey, you equipped a rare item. Cha-ching, you know? And there's not a single one for Paragon, much less, you know, par- a special one for level 10, you know, two characters to level 10, that kind of thing. Do you think they just threw Paragon at the last second and before this patch and didn't really have a chance to make all these other supporting features that everything else in the game has? It, it does definitely look like, you know, it was it was added in in a hurry and they didn't have time to fully support it like they, they might have if they, you know, were able to do it at their leisure. Can it really take that long to make new achievements? I mean, I was just amazed that the first Paragon level didn't give me some huge achievement ding, because everything else in the game does. Well, the, from what I understand of like the Blizzard uh, development teams is that the achievements would be developed by the, uh, the Battle.net team, and the, the, the Battle.net uh, team is kind of independent from all the other ones, except they do have a small dedicated crew for World of Warcraft, but otherwise the Battle.net team goes between franchise to franchise to franchise to work on other projects. And at the moment, I would imagine that it's uh, the, in, the entire Battle.net team is now being, you know, tasked with working on Heart of the Swarm since that beta just, you know, got up and running. And so they're probably, at, you know, when they are going through and making this patch, they're working on getting the, the beta up and running and supporting Heart of the Swarm and the last few uh, finishing touches for MOP. And so there probably wasn't much 
for them to uh, continue working on Diablo, and that might have been one of the reasons why they, uh, you know, weren't able to go through and add in achievements because they just didn't have time for that particular, you know, segment of the development. The heart of the swarm point is a very good one. Or they finally realize that the people that are going to be going after Paragon levels are not the kind of people that really care about achievements that really need that, you know, hey, congratulations, you, you know, equipped a rare item, you equipped uh, a legendary, you got level 10 in Paragon. They're going to be getting level 100 whether they get achievements for it or not. So in four weeks or six weeks or eight months, we're suddenly going to see like 100 achievements light up instantly. Hey, all those Paragon achievement levels have been backdated. And the next time you kill one single monster, you get 15 achievements all at once. Could be. Uh, or not. Might very well happen. Yeah. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past them putting them in after the fact. But if they don't, I don't think it's really that big of a deal. Speaking of players who care about achievements and banner rewards and such, have you guys played with your banner thing much? Do you even care what that looks like? I did once or twice. And... Because I, I rolled with a really ugly banner to start with, and so I like fixed it up a little bit, changed the colors around, and then as I would unlock new sigils, I'd go look at the sigil and go, oh, that kind of looks cool, but I'd never actually change it. How about you, Nineball? Uh, I messed around with mine a lot in the beginning, but I finally got it looking nice and haven't touched it since. That's what she said. <laughs> so... <laughs> so I, have, I have never touched mine since the beta. My, my banner, I mean, that's what she said. But I keep thinking I should someday. I mean, there's all these you know colors and it pops up every every now and then. You you get some random one. You know, you pick up. Five, I just got the five million gold pickup recently. And I was like, you know, some other bing. I'm like, oh, you totally forget this exists and it, something comes up. Like I should change that, but I never look at it. So who cares? It's one of those things that it really depends on your personality. I think. Is there an achievement in a banner reward for for adjusting your achievements in a banner rewards? I don't That's think so. Thought of that. That's a little recursive, isn't it? You changed your banner ten times. Here's a new banner. It's like, wait, what? Achievement awarded, indecisive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Achievement awarded, big girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of appearances, have you guys ever? Do you guys ever use the the dyes, the armor dyes in the game? That I do use um, because I don't want to walk around looking like a clown. So I usually buy all of one color and just dye my armor that way. Or I'll use the collector's edition dies that I have if a piece of armor looks really ugly. You play World of Warcraft nine ball, so you're accustomed to hideously ugly armor. Have you been using it? Well, actually, the colors in World of Warcraft, I play a warlock. So anyone that plays WoW would understand that one. Um, <laughs> so we we always get the badass armor sets, but uh, yeah, uh, I've just been using one of the collector's edition dies the entire time, just so it looks uniform. But I haven't really ever put much thought into expanding beyond that. Although, speaking of dies, whatever happened to the, uh, oh, we're going to put in code to allow legendaries and sets to be dyed. I'm still using a Talrush's Guardianship that I can't find a replacement for, and my Witch Doctor looks ugly because of it. Holy oh, cow. Well, one of my friends uh, is using a gold skin, and that is like the most hilarious thing, watching this like bright gold wizard walking around on the screen the entire time. Well, at least the color's appropriate. Yeah, it's, so it's appropriate for that, but it just it looks horrid in the game itself. I mean, at the end of the day, the color of your character really doesn't matter, but sometimes it's nice to not look at, you know, a garish clown suit. I, I'm surprised they don't actually ever drop any or give you any as a quest reward. Yeah, I thought that was going to be a big system. I mean, I mean, like like Nineball just mentioned, you got a couple of them with the collector's edition. But if you didn't buy that, I, I've literally never had an armor die since the beta, since we were testing them and the you know and you know grabbing them and stuff. Because mm -hmm. you never get any drops, you never get any from quest rewards. I didn't get the collector's edition, so it's like, well, why would I ever think to even use this? You know, it's weird they don't just you know at some point you think they just like a quest reward would turn all your gear bright red just to f with you or something, and it's like, oh hey, here, here, here here's your introduction to armor dies. You've been cursed by a wizard, and now your now your gear is red, Harry. You're, but we're gonna give you we're gonna give you some dyes. You can earn dye to to make the color go back or something. It's like that would get you involved in it. It just seems weird that you never put anything like that in. And yes. complete agreement from both yes. of you. Yes. <laughs> so, okay, next big topic: Inferno changes. They've been they've been teasing us and giving us little hints, but haven't said a whole lot about it. And then they gave us this big developer's diary where they're gonna make 
big nerfs in Inferno going to reduce monster damage about 25% or more. And they're also nerfing some of the overpowered player defensive skills. And they're saying that'll open up a little few more build options. We won't need four or five defensive skills to survive. Does this light your fire filter? Uh, yes. I'll, like, I wrote uh, for my notes for this podcast just giant yay under the defensive nerf slash buff. Um, I really like that defense is still valuable um, and that mobs will not one-shot you, maybe. I mean, that still remains to be seen. We have to wait until it actually gets live for us to test. Uh, it'll probably actually balance the requirement for resist all on gear, so maybe instead of now where it's like you'll die in two hits if you don't have 800 plus, maybe you only need 600. Uh, so that'll open up even more gearing options as well. Although 22% seems like kind of a big nerf to the mob damage, so it might end up being too much, which uh, could not be a bad thing. D2's normal mobs didn't kill you in two to three hits, so the normal mobs in D3 killing you in two to three hits seems a little bit excessive comparatively. Uh, I also didn't like what they said about the monk passive one with everything. I understand that that's going to be a huge gear change for a lot of monks, but it's this is the moment when they could have done something about it, and it would have fit perfectly, and they didn't do anything about it. But overall, it increases build diversity, which is awesome. What do you think, Ironball? Um, well, at least like speaking from a standpoint of the monk, it's like uh, the way that the, the monks are built, you know, it's like you nerf two of our defensive passives and the only like viable alternatives to replace them with are other not as effective defensive passives. You know, it's like the monk has very limited uh, offensive options uh, as far as their passives go. One of them requires you to use, you know, uh, multiple spirit generators, which not very many people do and will also kind of screw up your build for a very marginal increase in damage. And the other one requires you to be playing with other people, uh, since it only uh, has any effect when you use a direct heal on another player. Uh, so it's just, I don't, I wish that they would add more um, offensive capabilities into the monk passives to actually make it feel as if we have a real choice. Because at the moment it's like, oh, you nerfed Resolve, so I'll pick Transcendence, another defensive passive. Or you, mo- you nerf Seize the Initiative, I'll you know, take you know, uh, Near-Death Experience, another defensive passive. Or you know, just a whole bunch of other uh, defensive passives are all your options. There's, you know, they, they need to do more for the monk than just nerfing the best defensive passives. Um, and as far as like the one with everything, if they were to change that, they that would be that would be hell because it's like the the entire capability of a lot of people's monks, as far as being able to survive in the end game, is based off of that one passive. You know, they they went through and said how many uh, wizards are using energy armor, but they didn't break down like which how many of them were using this rune, how many of that were using the other. I I would say that you know uh, an even greater number of monks are all using one with everything. If they oh, were I'm to sure change they are. that, yeah. If they if they were to change that, you know, it's like they would have to nerf Inferno by a lot more than just like twenty or thirty percent because it's adding so much to monk survivability. Like I think in my gear, I only have maybe four or five hundred resistance to everything, and then another like uh, three hundred and fifty, four hundred, you know, lightning resist on my monk. So you you're gonna have my resists if you touch that skill. Oh, yeah, and I agree that it's going to be a huge gear change for monks when they do change it, if they change it like they say they're going to. We don't know how they're going to change it, but this patch, with the changes that they're making for defensive stuff, it just seems like it would be the perfect place for them to have changed it, however they're going to. They haven't thought it through yet, obviously. Or they want to see how the other changes play out before they decide how they can nerf that one on top of it. Yeah, oh, that could be. That could be. And of course, the other part of this is the whole player's X thing they're putting in, which they gave us no details about. There'll, there'll be some sort of customization of difficulty. Because you wonder, you know, if, if you don't need four defensive skills, you can make do with two or three after these nerfs. What will, what will happen to people who keep using four? Will the game be totally easy? And apparently the answer was yes, so now they have to make a way to customize it. And obviously, if you're making it harder for yourself on purpose, you're not just doing that for, you know, to feel like a man. You're doing it because you're going to get more loot or something. So they have to find some way to balance the risk-rewards. Some of the comments that I've seen just perusing the forums from the people that are in the upper echelons of, you know, they can only farm Act 4, and they, they 
trounce over every mob that they find. Uh, it'll allow them to kind of go back to what Inferno was supposed to be originally and go wherever you want to farm. As long as they increase the uh, drops accordingly with the monster difficulty. And I hope they also add uh, bonus experience as well. Uh, if you play on Monster Power 8 or whatever it's going to end up being, you get more experience. Yeah. Well, that was the case in Diablo 2. Yeah. basically hoping it comes back as players, just with a different fancy name. That was one of the things that I was wondering, is like, how is that going to uh, interact with actual uh, multiplayer if in the game? Can, you know, it's like, can you have like monster levels one through four and you can use it regardless of how many players are in? So can you have a four player game and then still do, you know, like, you know, up the monster power level to four, you know, to quadruple or whatever it is that they're going to do the loot for everybody in the game? Or is it going to be capped at four and that system only work while you're playing solo or with a few people? I'm hoping it'll be a lot more than just increasing the experience. Because, I mean, like Filter was just saying, people wanted the flat difficulty across Inferno, so you could actually go farm Act 1 or Act 2 again. And obviously, if you just make Act 1, you know, if you just double the zombie hit points, that's not going to make a difference. People have really good gear. You need to do something to really change some of the basic play styles and, you know, change their damage and everything else. It has to scale up. And their damage doesn't scale up with more people. You know, they just take longer to kill. So, yeah. It's more of a project than just, you know, sliding the, the bar in the spreadsheet slightly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they're going to have to add to monster damage, depending on your monster power rating, whatever that you set. They're going to have to increase the health, the damage, just like D2 did. Oh. Basically, that's, that keeps coming back to that point. If it's like the player's command from D2, it's going to be a very great tool to use. Okay, another nifty thing in the patch preview, the Infernal Machine, which we only know one sentence about. Okay, two sentences. Uh, here's my uh, quoting it. The Infernal Machine is a device that will allow level 60 players to battle uber versions of some of Sanctuary's most nefarious bosses. While the rewards for defeating these bosses will be great, some assembly is required. I wrote an article about this with some theories about stuff. If you guys check that out or have your own thoughts, what, what do you think this is going to mean? I'm beginning to get like, a, like an arena level with a, like monster generators. What assembly is required? Yeah, when, when I read that, I, I immediately thought to, you know, the uh, Uber Tristram runs, you know, the, the basically just going through and doing uh, key runs in order to open up Uber Tristram. Uh, it, it was my th first thoughts. And that's what I put in the article. Yeah, exactly. you'd, have to go, you'd have to go kill various monsters to get certain components and you would basically it's how the secret you know the secret whimsy shire level works mm -hmm. and, and like, you have to go you have to go find pieces and then you can turn those pieces into something that takes you to a new level and one of the other things like the uh that the uh uber tristram runs did was they uh players in diablo 2 of course they would always just go and you know uh kill bail or kill certain bosses what they did with the keys is they put the the keys on uh, the pieces on you know mobs uh, like little uh, sub bosses and such that no one ever ran, especially like uh, the summoner and Nilothok. You know, people people just never even did that. I mean, half the time people would just skip the Nilothok quest in Act Four on uh, Hell just because of how painful that area was. Uh, but you know, they made it to where you now have to go. You're given a reason to go and kill these, you know, uh, underutilized bosses within the game in order to try and get these really good rewards. And so I'm wondering if it'll be a consumable item like that. And where you have to go and kill, say, uh, Magda and Gom and like Iswal or whatever, in order to actually uh, get these pieces to assemble it, then go and fight the Uber versions, and you're allowed to fight only so many, and then you have to go and get all the pieces again. I liked the idea that it, like you said, it made it in D2 key runs uh, where you had to go fight bosses that nobody really went and fought. So uh, my idea for the Infernal Machine, is that mats to build whatever it is have a chance to drop off of the purple name rares in Acts. Because right now those purple name rares are dumb. There's no reason for them to be there other than a little bit of flavor. Most of the time you don't even notice they're there because they're dead by the time you mouse over on them. Um, one or two pieces would drop from each act, so maybe one from the first half of an act and one from the second half of an act. And it would end up being a gauntlet-style fight. Like, you go through a portal, and it would be a gauntlet-style fight where you fight one boss, then another, then another, each one at a time, but with no pause in between. 
So you couldn't rest up, you couldn't change skills, you couldn't do anything like that. Um, they all have new abilities, and some have minions and some don't. So, like, if you had Gom as part of it, he would spawn a lot more of the little uh, slimelings. Or Bale might have a bunch of those demon soldiers with him. Uh, it could include every boss if we wanted it to, or if they design it to. At the end, it would drop a class-based bind on pickup or bind on account legendary, and it would also drop a bunch of item level 63 rares, just as loot. Oh boy, more rares. Well, Yay. guaranteed level 63, but the big thing that people would be doing it for is the class-based BOP legendary. Yeah, speaking of binding, that's the whole thing I wanted to get into in the auction house. Any other Infernal Machine thoughts before we get to the auction house stuff? I think that if they're going to be giving a big enough reward for people to want to be doing this, it's going to have to be a legendary. But before we talk too much about the auction house, it's going to flood the auction house. And so it, they have to bring binding into the game to counter that if they want the reward to be legendaries or something else that's worthy of a player's time to want to go do this. And speaking of the auction house and binding, that's one of the things I think needs to be done a little bit. But yeah. They've, they've teased about auction house improvements. They, you know, they basically they've made a lot of incremental improvements since the game came out. You know, improving the search fields and improving you can search on the mods in uniques, that kind of stuff. But they haven't really made any big changes. And Jay Wilson mentioned in, a, in his, in his uh, apology that turned into a, here's some interesting stuff to distract you from my apology. Yeah. There was you know, a few things about changes to the auction house and some bigger... One thing that people were wondering about in advance, we had a whole podcast about this long before they actually announced the auction house, and, and Nineball was on that, giving us a lot of details about how the WoW auction house works, which I'm going to ask him in a moment. But one of the things that we had kind of two main concerns with the auction house in Diablo 3, and it was that it would be really hard to find what you wanted because random mods have so many different possibilities, so many different possible affixes. And they've actually done a pretty good job with that. Mm -hmm. But the other... Yeah, that, that, I mean, you can actually you can find pretty much what you want. I mean, especially they've gotten better with that over yeah, time. Yeah, now, now that you can search for, you know, uh, all six fields on a weapon. Or and a, higher item. than a thousand. Yeah, it's, it's very, very nice that you can, uh, you know, go through and do that now. Now, if only they allowed us to search for everything, because you have, like, the legendaries that will roll a mod on it, like the Lucani Prowlers that have movement speed on a bracer, if they just allow us to, you know search for pieces of armor that have the movement speed and specifically a bracer without, you know, uh, immediately removing that because, you know, it's like they're like, well, normal items can't have this, so we're just going to remove it. But I want to search specifically through the Lakani Prowlers with that movement speed affix. You know, although they have it to where you can now search within a legendary um, for uh, specific stats uh, like you, you couldn't before, it would still be nice Like if I'm looking for all of my armor alternatives with a certain set of uh, abilities, whether they're like the uh, monk set pants or the Connie prowlers and you know things of that nature. That would be nice if they opened it up a little bit more. One of the things that I'm really disappointed that I haven't seen yet being added in is looking for mojos or wizard offhands with... Like, the they don't allow you to search for the damage. Yeah. So I have to just constantly scroll through pages and, you know, move my mouse down each individual item and look at the damage. But besides, I don't want to have to do uh, that. Yeah, besides, like, still getting, like, one-shotted by the uh, Blood, Cl uh, Blood Clan Maulers, uh, that's probably the second biggest complaint that I've heard from all of my wizard friends is that uh, uh, not being able to search for that damage uh, property on their offhand. And that's why I don't think they sell very easily. Like, you might find a really good mojo, or you might find a really good source, but it's like, well, is anybody going to actually find it in the plethora of items to actually buy it? Yeah, I, I found, like, a, a perfect damage roll on a blue Demi Lich, and it had intelligence and a socket, and I tried selling it for ages, and I could never even sell it for, like, a hundred thousand gold because I just wanted to get rid of it to free up some inventory space. But yeah, and if somebody you know, found no one, it, no it would be great. Yeah, if if someone had found it, you know, it's like I'm almost surprised that people that you know go and flip items on the auction house didn't you know pick it up. And that Azure is sitting there, you know, rubbing his hands together that he found such a, a great steal. But uh, yeah, it's it's just like it's a real testament to how hard it is to find you know good. Um, offhands without specifically searching for, you know, like, legendary offhands and such. Yeah. 
we had two main concerns about the auction house in advance. One of them was what we just said, you know, searching and finding what you want. And the other one was we were we were afraid that because World of Warcraft has hundreds of realms and there's only, you know, 10,000 people trading items on each realm or something. Whereas in Diablo 3, we were going to have, you know, three realms or four realms with a million people on each one. There would be such a vast flood of items in, in that we, you would never be able to find what you want. And that's kind of, I don't mean, I don't know if that's, you know, obviously it's kind of hard to sell stuff as you just testified to, but that's more about the searchable problems. But have you found, do you think, I mean, so what if they split up the U.S. into, you know, 15 or 10 or 100 different auction houses, and you had to put your item into one of those, like a realm kind of thing. Do you think that would improve the trading in some way, or would it just make it more fractured? Well, it would be less I think overwhelming. That, in my opinion and everything, and the problems that I've been, the actual problems that I've been having with the auction house, um, you know, before and even now, is the, the prices of items uh, are just, you know, more or less uh, when I look for an upgrade on my monk, you know, it's I'm either having to try and find a steal of someone that post that undervalued their item, or I'm having to spend twenty, twenty five million gold, you know, per item that I want to get for an upgrade, and I just haven't had the time to play to, you know, make that kind of money in the game. And if you go through and you segment it more and create less competition, the prices are gonna go up even higher than what they are now. So I, I think that that wouldn't really solve any problems because I think that's probably one of the biggest complaints that I hear about anyone with the auction house is the prices are all too high. And so if you, if you limit that supply even further of people being able to put items into the auction house, it's only going to make that even worse. And I think part of that is not so much a problem with the auction house, but just that anyone that's played the game can attest to is how many crap items do you find when you go through and do a run? Like I, I run, I, will run like yeah All exactly siege breaker to asmodan you know i'll go through and you know i've done it you know who knows how many times you know since the uh, paragon levels have come out and i found two upgrades for my character and that's it and i think maybe uh i found one legendary which i was able to sell and two or three other uh like strength or intelligence items that have actually sold for any decent amount in the auction house and you know vendored probably literally hundreds of rares that are just garbage. Yeah, and uh, again, if they introduce binding almost as a if this item rolls a high enough like item value, I'm sure they keep track of like this stat if rolled this high has this much value. If an item rolls with a high enough value, it's just bound. That 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 I think would also, you know, create an even larger problem because that's that's again that's limiting the supply of items that are in the auction house for the prices to come down there has to be more of them that people want to find more of these items or at least that there's more competition so that pre people begin to you know lower their prices in order to sell versus other people if you start introducing items that are bound that's going to limit that supply of the good items that are in the auction house and a lot of the times it's going to basically limit to where if you want one of these bound items, you're going to have to find it yourself because everyone else that actually does find it, they're either going to sell it, you know, for $250 on the, uh, the RMAH or they're going to use it themselves. And you're never going to see these things actually appearing in the market. That's also very true. So to imagine this in World of Warcraft terms, because World of Warcraft has had an auction house almost since the launch, right? Uh, yeah, since launch. But it's not really used for items because almost everything good is item bound. You just use it for like materials and such, consumables. Yeah, for yeah. that. Uh, yeah, mostly that's used for you know vanity items such as uh, pets and other items, or uh, for leveling your crafting professions. Uh, and the only real gear that gets traded in it is like lower level gear for leveling alts, or the very few items that are BOE that are dropped from raids or that are crafted using materials from raids. And, you know, those, those trade at a premium because they're still, you know, scarce and hard to get. So the main complaint with the Diablo 3 auction house is that it's, it's too hard to find gear, and that forces you to use the auction house. And also the auction house is so much easier to find gear in. You can go in and spend 50k. If you're a low-level character, mid-level, you know, I mean, you've got a paragon, but you haven't really been farming. You can easily upgrade every single thing you're wearing for, like, 25k a piece. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Oh, yeah. It's, I, I think it's when I leveled my wizard and um, my demon hunter, which I stopped playing. Uh, you know, it's like every 10 levels, I'd stop. I'd take, you know, 25,000 gold, go into the auction house, and, you know, double all of their stats, and, 
you know, add like another like plus 25 onto their experience gain per kill or whatever, you know, just, you know, and made like leveling my wizard, you know, it was so easy. I spent, you know, barely any gold on him, but the thing is like, he was like level 30 and had like 8,000 damage or something like that. We're probably not that high, but you know, it was just ridiculous. It's like, I'd send out, you know, one arcane orb and it would just cut through everything in the game, you know, or rare and elite packs and stuff like that as I was leveling through, you know, normal and nightmare and everything would just be one shotted. Although after that initial upgrade, it, the price for just incremental gains in your stats increases dramatically. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, so everything is cheap in the auction house except for the really high end. Yeah, it's like everything is either garbage or it's like hundreds of millions of gold. Yeah, there's not a lot of in-between. It's hard to get into that auction market. You know, unless you find something just spectacular to sell, you can never get enough gold to buy anything spectacular. Yeah. Uh, it's, kind of, it's, yeah it's, or, it's, it's like the old, you know, you can't get a job without experience, but you can't get experience without yeah, a job. Yeah, it's like there, there, there's, there's certain entry points, but they, they're all, uh, like, with uh, my problem of being able to get back up into the auction house is just, you know, lack of time. And, you know, a lot of people that, uh, they'll just, they'll, they'll probably spend as much time in the auction house as they will actually playing the game, you know, searching... Uh, for items that they can go through and flip, you know, deals that are, you know, really low priced items uh, that they can then buy and then sell for, you know, a couple million, if not, you know, tens of million more than what they bought it for. Like I, I you know, found, came across a couple really good deals of some, you know, two handed weapons that, you know, I found for under a million, which I then went and sold, you know, for like three or four million just because, you know, it's, people were just very underpricing what they were worth. So the problem in Diablo 3 is that people feel that they have to play the auction house, and many people have complained, it's something that Dave Brevik said in a, in a recent news thing, that the base of the game is a, grind, is a gold grind. You just want to find crap to turn into gold so you can then buy better gear. And, and you know, sometimes you find stuff, sometimes your gold is picked up off the ground, sometimes it's an item that you sell in the auction house. But that is not how World of Warcraft works, and they've had an auction house forever in that game. So why is there not this problem in World of Warcraft where people feel like you're just playing for the auction house? Is it all just basically, basically item binding? I think binding? it's binding. It's, yeah, well, it, it's binding, but that is only a part of the equation in World of Warcraft. Because in World of Warcraft, you know where you can find the good gear. And it just takes, you know, time in which to go through and, like, do those raids or do those dungeons. But you know that boss is going to drop the gloves, which are an upgrade for me. So I just have to keep killing that boss, and eventually I'll get it. You know, the odds are pretty good. You know, it's like I can go onto the website, and it shows, oh, he drops it 15% of the time. I run him for a couple of weeks, and I'm going to get my gloves, and I'm going to have my upgrade. Uh, you know, uh, it, that doesn't, and, that and doesn't upgrade, apply in Diablo. The, and the, the upgrade items in WoW are all, like, sets and legendary equivalents, right? So it's not, you're not trying to get, you know, just get lucky roll. You know he's going to drop these gloves that have, you know, strength and speed and casting. Yeah, this they, much they have, strength, this much yeah, speed. Yeah, they, they have, you know, set item, you know, item statistics on it. So you know exactly what it is that you're going to get. So why does the Diablo 3 system of random item drops combine with the auction house to make the game all about gold? And whereas Diablo 2, you, you could use the, you know, there was no auction house, obviously, but you could trade, but you didn't really need to. Was it just the whole, you find lots more gear in Diablo 2? You find lots more rares and, and I mean, legendaries and sets? It, it definitely felt easier in Diablo 2 to uh, find, uh, you know, rares and sets and things of that nature. You know, there were some, like, the, uh, the high-end elite uniques, like Death's Web and such, where they were, like, near impossible to find as like many of the legendaries in Diablo three were, but there were also many low level ones like uh goblin toe, uh, for example, you could, you could find them and they were like a, a normal level item, I believe. So it's something that you would just find in normal mode or the beginning of nightmare. They were useful, you know, at, in hell, you know, they were a useful item, no matter what level you were, if you had those, they were great. You know, it'd be the equivalency of, um, uh, like cane set, the like the level twenty ish, you know, cane set being useful at level sixty. You know, it had stats that would be uh, worthwhile to actually go through and farm those lower difficulties in which to get. Or you know, you might just be leveling up a new character and all of a sudden, oh, you know, it's like I can't believe like 
there was one time I was leveling uh, a low-level Diablo 2 character, and in the jail I found a gold dagger, and I immediately you know threw that over to like my level 80 necromancer, so I could go and do uh, magic vine runs. You know, it's there was always something that you might potentially find when leveling a new character that would help out your higher level. Now it just requires you to go through and farm you know, the Inferno mode and hope and pray that one of these super rare items drops, where in Diablo 2, almost anything that you killed had the capability of dropping something that would be useful, no matter what level you were. So what do we do to fix Diablo 3? Do we make more sets and legendaries drop, and yet some of them are, are BOE or BOA? or I, I don't think anybody wants BOP, it, especially with different class requirements. Yeah, I, I think it's probably, you know, a little bit too early to really tell because, you know, the vast majority of people, at least, like, uh, I think the highest level uh, Paragon on my friends list is, like, uh, 26. You know, most people are still very low in the Paragon levels that are going through and playing the game casually. And so it's really, you know, hardcore, dedicated people that are in, like, the the, uh, higher um, levels. Once more people start getting like above 50 or so and start reaching that magic find cap and making their farming a lot more efficient in the higher acts, we'll have to see how many of these legendaries actually go through and start appearing. I mean, in uh, just in my short time playing, I've at least found two legendaries. Only one of them was worthwhile. The other one was still garbage. But the fact that I found two of them where previously I'd found none in the hundred plus hours that I spent on my monk and the other hundred or so hours I spent on my wizard and I found nothing, you know, at least gives me a little bit more hope that these items are going to drop more often. And as I get closer and closer to the magic find cap, they'll hopefully start appearing, you know, even more so. So, you know, give it another couple of months when the majority of the population is higher into the Paragon levels. There's more overall magic find. There's more overall items that are entering the economy. We'll, we'll have to go through and see. And if finding these really good items is still like an amazing event that happens, you know, once in a blue moon and that the, you have like all the uh, class sets are still selling for like 20, 30, 40 million in the auction house, uh, you know, then there's probably something that still needs to be addressed at that point in terms of drop rates. Yeah. I'm curious to see if the Inferno becoming easier makes a difference, because that's kind of the other big aspect of the Diablo 2 comparison. Mm-hmm. You, you didn't need super top-quality gear to play Diablo 2's endgame, so there wasn't that kind of pressure to get it. I mean, people wanted it because they wanted it, but you know, you could do Diablo 2's endgame in mediocre quality stuff that you can't even do Act 1 Inferno in, in Diablo 3, the equivalent of that kind of yeah, gear. Yeah, that's, uh, that's also a very good point, as those people that are currently stuck, um, even now, like, only farming Act 1, you know, which isn't very efficient, and especially in terms of trying to find, you know, higher-level gear. And I think there was, like, one of the developer comments is, like, the set pieces only drop in Act 3 and Act 4. You know, it's like once those people are able to transition into Act 3, Act 4, or even just Act 2, you're going to see the their quality of their drops, you know, marginally increase. And that's, you know, but if you have a large enough people that have made that transition, that's going to make a noticeable impact into the auction house. He's talking about you right there, Filter. So what do you <laughs> think? Yeah. Stuck farming Act yeah, 1. Yeah, I've basically just been stuck farming. Oh, act right one. in the child. Oh. Eh. But I like Act 1. It's my favorite act, so I don't really mind it. That's that's handy. Yeah, it? it is it is handy. If I didn't like it, then it'd be much more of a grind. Um, I think these defensive nerfs are really going to help progress a lot of people like me that are kind of stuck farming Act One to get into Act Three and Four. And yes, it will bring a lot more of these items into the auction house, and maybe it'll drive prices down. And maybe after we see, you know, a majority of the upper level player base farming Act 3 and Act 4, a need for binding might actually make itself known and make itself very apparent. Well, the theory with binding is is if you have it, then you can drop lots more of the stuff, so everybody else has a better chance to get it, because then it won't flood the economy. So, I mean, I mentioned that in a, in a comment, and this, somebody responded, oh, that's a horrible idea. If I, finally ever, if I ever find anything good, I'll be able to sell it, etc. But, of course, the problem is now you, you don't find anything good because they have to make the drop rates really low because they, they wanted Diablo 3 to have a stable economy. You know, Diablo 2, you know, you could spawn out uniques and, and sets like candy because they just reset the realm, you know, they just reset the ladders every six months or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so because they're trying to make Diablo 3 be a stable long-term economy, they had to make the drops of the really good stuff much rarer. And they've kind of tried to compensate for that in patches by making you find a billion rares, 
But as we've all pointed out, you don't, you don't even value rares anymore because they're always crap. Yeah, and I'm obvious, but you have to either have a stable economy with really boring drops because, well, when one person finds one really good thing, you don't want a million people to be finding millions of good things all the time because then nothing is worth anything and you get into an item currency like we had in Diablo 2. Or what you have to do is give binding, and yes, it decreases the quality of things on the auction house, but it makes drops more interesting. It's a well, trade-off. Either way that the solution well, is going to come, it's going to be a trade-off. There, there's, there's also the third solution, which the, a lot of people you know, have been uh, clamoring for, and that is to reintroduce ladder resets. Although I, we, I used I, to think I, ladder resets were really annoying because I would you know, play for like a month or two of Diablo and then go away for a couple months and then come back and like, oh, all my characters that found really awesome stuff are gone. But now I'm kind of seeing that ladder resets would be awesome if it lets us get better items. Faster. Yeah, I mentioned, yeah, I, I mentioned that, but I, I'm not a fan of the ladder resets myself unless they open up the number of character uh, slots we have, and you know they make a they make a slate of characters that you can play like per ladder reset. You know, it's like because as it is, only having ten characters that would be that'd be horrible. Like a new ladder comes along, uh, who which of my you know, level 56 Paragon characters am I going to have to delete today? You know, that, that that would just be horrible. Yeah, that would be horrible. It's, it's weird because they don't really have, you know, like, like, like the, the ladder reset thing kind of made sense in Diablo 2 because they already had the realm characters versus single player character kind of thing. So there was already a sort of a different tier of characters. But in Diablo 3, you just only have, you know, the one pot. So it'd be weird if they were suddenly dividing that into multiple sections. It's like a whole new mm-hmm. way of thinking. I'd be shocked if they do that first. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, this is D3. It's not D2.5. Although it's rapidly becoming that. <laughs> it's, it's taking the good parts of D2 and bringing them in. Yeah, there's a lot of reinventing of the ARPG wheel in D3, and I, I think some things are good. Like, I, I don't miss potion spam at all, Definitely you know, not. but... No, God. But then there's other things that just, you know, they keep, you know, like, like they're putting in... You know, they're ch- changing crafting and the item. Everyone doesn't like the item system in D3 and want more sets and legendaries and... You know, obviously the the player's axe and the the, the infernal machine is like the pan, pan the pandarian level. Sorry, wrong game. Pandemonium event. I wonder if they're going to do anything with crafting with this infernal machine as well. I mean, obviously some assembly required. Okay, it's going to be some items like the staff of herding that you have to collect and put together. I wonder if they're going to be dropping they have, plans they have big or something. Yeah, yeah I'd, be, I'd be nice to find plans. I, I, I think two. I found the same one nine times or something. Yeah. Yes, I, I have no idea how many exalted dread shield plans that I sold. That was probably one of the one of the like worst changes. And I think it was 1.03 that I saw was when I had an exalted like the four property plan drop in Act Three. When it normally it you like before 1.03, it used to be that the four properties dropped in Act One, the five properties dropped in Act Two, and then the six properties dropped in Act Three and Act Four, and there was no crossing. And then they made it to where it can drop anywhere. That first time that I saw the Exalted Dread Shield drop in Act Three, I cried a little. And you only had seven of them yeah. already, so it'd be nice if you could combine multiple of the same plans into a better plan. Yeah. You know, you did add a uh, socket or something. There, there was actually it. something that I was talking with some of my friends earlier today about what they, they uh, disliked about the crafting system was uh, in uh, Diablo 2, there was like the, uh, um, I think it was the safe, like the safety items, the bloody items and such that you could go through and craft. And uh, some of them, you know, could be really, really good for like in-game items. Like you could get, uh, like a bloody amulet for a, like a melee assassin or a barbarian. So you'd have, you know, like lifesteal strength, and then you could roll the class skills on them and such. Uh, but a lot of them, you know, didn't really compare to the sets and the uniques once you got them, but they were good alternatives in the meantime, you know, that you could use. And they had set, you know, affixes that they would always roll. They would always, like a bloody item would always have uh, strength, would always have vitality, and would always have, like, lifesteal um, you know, on most of the, the item piece, it, it changed depending upon whether you're crafting like a ring or a glove or whatever. But you could always be guaranteed to get those. Maybe if they uh, they have something like that in the really, really uh, rare patterns, you know, such as like the uh, the Sage's Boots and the Sage's Gloves where it has the set 
properties and then has a few random ones. But maybe if they introduced, you know, more uh, plans that would have, say, you get like a glove pattern, which has always will roll um, like crit and then five properties on it or, you know, a weapon that always rolled life on hit or life steal and then five additional properties. So you could always try and game, you know, it's like, well, I can, I can craft this set of gloves because I want crit or I could craft this set of gloves because I want attack speed and take a gamble on the less the rest of the properties. If they added something like that in, I think that might help the crafting system a little bit more. Uh, so that way you had a little bit uh, better idea of what it was that you were getting instead of, you know, finding something with, you know, increased health glor, uh, uh, health orb pickup range and plus to health orb heals and stuff like that. Yeah, some way to provide the player more control over what is crafted, whether it's having more patterns drop with a guaranteed stat or having some way to influence those random stats that are dropped. Like uh, several times I've seen ideas where it's like, oh, if you include a gem in, when you're crafting, you know, these gloves, it gives you plus crit damage. Or if you include this gem, it gives you plus, you know, lifesteal or whatever. Yeah, because currently the crafting system, I mean, they've said they're going to make improvements. And I'm sure we'll see some of this kind of stuff. But, I mean, now it's basically you're paying, you know, 80k to make a level 62 rare, which is a 99% chance yeah. of sucking. Yeah. Uh-huh. So it's, I can just go. I can just go play for twenty minutes and find this for free. Yeah, you know? it's. I think that 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 the crafting is really appealing uh, to uh, the demographic of people in Diablo two that enjoyed gambling. Yeah, you know, they you know just save up a bunch of money and crafting materials and stuff Except like that. Except gambling was cheap. Yeah, yeah. gambling was cheap <laughs> compared to this. I think the best use of crafting that I've seen uh, so far is a lot of the people on the streams that will they'll they'll craft a whole bunch of gloves or whatever, and then they'll sell it off at auctions. You know, it's like you'll buy, you know, it's like they, they'll they bid on, you know, like 20, like uh, 20 or 24 or whatever sets of gloves, unidentified six property gloves, and people will throw, you know, five or six million, you know, at it at a time, you know, just for this, you know, this lot of gloves and such. Uh-huh. And so the person, the person that's crafting them, you know, he might not be able to get the big payoff if one of them, rolls a really good item, but he's guaranteeing himself an income because he can just go and craft a certain amount of these for, you know, a certain amount of money, sell it for a profit, take all that, buy all the mats out of the auction house, and then do it all over again. Yeah, but he's winning because he's basically playing a, he's playing a Vegas casino boss. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like he's, he's always making a profit, so he doesn't really care. And the other people that are gambling are, you know, they're risking the payoff. Occasionally somebody makes a jackpot, but what's the chances of them actually making a jackpot? Yeah. There's a reason that there's a new casino in Vegas every six months. Uh (laughs) Okay, any any last thoughts, guys? What are you looking forward to? Just all this patch stuff and hoping... Taking defensive abilities off of some of my builds and replacing them with other abilities that I think fit them better. Uh, Maybe actually getting through Act (laughs) 3. As a monk, I can't wait for that day when I can actually remove defensive abilities for offensive ones, because I don't have any offensive ones with which to choose. Uh, but I, I, I definitely like the direction that they're continuing to go, and the fact that they really have been putting... I think that they really, uh, at least in my opinion, that they've been putting a lot more time and effort into the game after its release than I was really expecting them to. I, I was expecting a little bit more of a slower pace in terms of the amount of uh, content and stuff that they would be adding in. And the fact that they're, you know, going through and adding in something already, like the Pandemonium event. Like, I think in your article you mentioned something. It took them, like, five years to put that into Diablo 2, and now we're, you know, probably going to have that before the end of the year now. You know, I, 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 re- I really like that they still are continuing to care and that they want to make things right. And, you know, it, it just gets... It's been getting better with every single patch that's been coming out. So, you know, well, what is the game going to look like by the time they get to the first expansion? Yeah, I got to say, I think that as much as I love Diablo 3, it was one of the least good games that came out, like the way it came out. But it's been constantly getting better, and it really shows that the developers want this game to succeed, the amount that they've been patching and putting in new uh, new features and stuff like that. Yeah, I had that same thought while Nineball was talking. I think they planned on taking off more time before they put new features <laughs> in as well, but... But they were like, oh, shit, you know, this is horrible. People are, are really pissed. We better scramble and get some stuff going. Although so. it, 
That's why we saw things like the Paragon level launch without any achievements tied to it. They were rush job. This has to get in right now because this game is a. We got it's problems. not like it really matters to them. We're not paying a subscription. It, they're EPing. It diminishes. This is true. <laughs> and and they do have a certain people. sort of company professionalism and reputation that they have to keep up. I'm sure. And you're forgetting the vast fortunes they make off RMAH sales. As we know, every feature is designed purely to spur more RMAH, so they can, you know, skim off their 17. Yeah, gold plating yeah. Bobby's toilet is expensive, so. And the yeah, mansion, exactly. Yes. That's what I was going to say. You know, Bobby's got a guest house that he has to go through and put gold toilets in. Think of him, people. Think of him and his non-gold toilets. Okay, that's good. We, I, we started off with a Bobby joke, and you've brought one here almost at the very end. So we, we've met our contractual obligations. Excellent. And we have yes. plugged other RPGs, too, so. Exactly. Torchlight 2, Torchlight 2. Borderlands 2. Okay, so... Oh, yeah, there you go. Cha-ching, and the paycheck's in the mail. Hopefully I'll get this posted, like, Monday, because I'm afraid they're going to launch some... We're recording this Sunday afternoon. They're going to launch some, you know, there'll be some huge thousand-word write-up Monday morning with, like, all these details about stuff we've been speculating on that proves everything we said wrong. Yeah, so it's like, and the, I'll post, I'll post and the before, first 15 comments on the post are going to be like, don't you guys know anything? God! Yeah. Why do you guys okay, suck the so bad? Doing, yeah, as of Sunday afternoon uh, U.S. time, we are currently using the most no- most known information available. So I'll get this up before uh, that changes, hopefully, as she said. Okay, guys, thanks for your time. You've been listening to the Diablo Podcast, and we are online at DiabloPodcast.com. Moo. 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 Moo.